another UX Joburg Meetup. My name is Mika Buliwe and I'll be your host this evening. First and foremost, to kick off this evening, I would like to thank UX Joburg sponsor, Sam Dollar Design. If you'd like to find out about their services, um, check out their website on sanddollardesign.co. And also, ladies and gentlemen, could you please have your Microsoft, uh, your micro, um, your speaker muted? So to kick off this evening, there will be um, three board sections to this meetup today, namely the theoretical, practical and networking components. For the theoretical components, our speaker for this evening will be talking about building role-based personas. So please submit your questions using the chat feature and Teams. Um, for the practical components, we will apply what we have learned and will be allocated into breakout rooms. Our speaker will walk us through every step of that process. And to wrap up the evening, we will do some networking with our fellow UH Joburg attendees. Um, of the um, speaker, speaker. speaker to answer. So please add any questions you have for our speaker in the meeting chat. To quickly announce some UX Joburg community news, um, we will be giving away we will be giving away five tickets to UX South Africa, which is taking place from the first to the third of June online. The tickets will be awarded to five lucky attendees tonight based on the level of interaction during tonight's meetup. So that includes asking a lot of your burning questions um, in the Q&A section. So if you'd like to win these amazing tickets, guys, um, please ask your questions and do not shy away until so Frank can answer all the questions this evening. A quick disclaimer, the session is being recorded. Um, so don't worry about not being able to remember some of the insightful things that our speaker will be discussing today. Just sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, um, and the recording will be made available on two platforms. Um, firstly, our YouTube channel uh, called UH Joburg. If you haven't subscribed to our channel already, please do so so that you can receive notifications every time we upload a new video. You can find videos um, of our past events as well on the channel. We also provide um, a UH Jovo podcast. These are, um, these are short form focusing purely on the speaker's talk. Um, we have posted Adam Rodmiel's talk um, about the scientific method of product design, which was the speaker that we had um, in our last UH Jovo meetup, um, in case you missed our previous events. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now moving on to our main event for today's meetup. And I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Frank Spillers. So Frank is the founder of Experience Dynamics, a leading UX consulting firm with Fortune 500 clients on the world. For over 20 years, Frank has been an internationally respected researcher, designer, speaker, author, Hi. How are you I think, hi, good, thanks. I think you said you're handing it over to me. You were sort of cutting in and out there. I was wondering if that was, that was a Teams feature. <laughs> um, 
so hopefully the floor is yours all right cheers thanks i i uh i hope that that also doesn't happen while while i'm trying to speak but let's uh let's see how we get on here apologies in advance if that's the case um so i think you should be able to see my screen here it's the same it says like uh building role-based personas um, let's see. Do you see that? Um, I oh, can't right. see. Can everyone else see the front, front screen? Uh, let me let me try it again. Frank, uh, are you sharing your screen? Yeah, I think so. Should okay, be. there. Is that it? Yeah. Building role-based personas. Yes. And there's a bio. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this session. And uh, the, the topic is role-based personas. And thanks so much, Mika, for that lovely introduction. Um, I also, uh, some of you know me from the Interaction Design Foundation, and I'm teaching live at uxinnercircle.com uh, to a small group of um, dedicated learners. So role-based personas. Uh, the only game in town is one way that you can think about it. The reason I say that is that there's so many flavors of personas or interpretations of personas, and we're going to talk about a little bit about why that is. But the the thing that I want you to go away with isn't it, it isn't that there are many different approaches to personas or the pr approach or the way that you're doing personas is, is just another way to do personas. But I, I want to drive home best practice and that notion that there's only one game in town. And it's a message that's not that widely circulated, um, you know, and I, I've been watching for many years as designers and researchers and UX professionals and also new teams to UX get confused and hung up and misdirected by this lack of foundational best practice with personas specifically. Um, so we're going to talk about role-based personas. We're going we're gonna to talk pros and cons and eight must-haves of personas, kind of the cheat sheet of today's webinar, as well as do a little bit of hands-on that Mika alluded to, and then we'll conclude with governance and evangelism and, and managing your personas. Um, I just want to say, Mika, as well, there's going to be um, a few more interactive sessions, so it might not be so neatly fitting into that okay. middle bit of your, yeah, so I have I have a few more um, activities that I've added as well. So let's let's go ahead and get started then with uh, the pros and cons of, of persona types and tools. Um, but before we do, we we should probably talk about the business case for personas. That if you do personas in your work, what it helps you to do is make better decisions. But it also helps business analysts to bring in validated requirements up front, right? And I'll talk a little bit about this later, but there are two sides to UX. There's usability, as you know, and there's desirability. Desirability is actually more important than usability, uh, as Don Norman famously once said. And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, that's so such an interesting remark. Why is desirability more important than usability? It's because if you give people what they want, it doesn't really matter if it sucks, uh, they'll still put up with it. That's that's a real thing, you know. Um, you might wanna put your mics to mute here, or maybe if we can get like a, a, a mute on, on most of the mics, that would be great. Um, Cause I hear somebody like breathing <laughs> there. So the other important point about the business case is a four times return on investment from a redesign that uses personas. That's coming from Forrester Research, a study that they did in 2010. Um, and on that note of ROI, this is a, another case study that uh, Marketing Sherpa 
uh, shared, and there are, there are actually many persona-based ROI case studies that Marketing Sherpa has tracked over the years, including one of our own. But we also have our own at Experience Dynamics, we're a UX consulting firm, um, and we've been using personas and uh, user research to create remarkable, uh, you know, the, when I say remarkable, 300 to 400% increase in revenue from B2B sites and B2C sites. So we had a recent e-commerce site with a 10 times increase in sales uh, on the, the launch of the new site. And it was the foundational research, the really understanding that desirability criteria that, that led us to that. So there's a good business case for personas, but I the topic of today's talk is more around how you approach personas, because I don't really know in all those other case studies and measurements of ROI, I don't really know how they did their personas and how you do your personas will impact your ROI. I'm only saying that from my point of view. I've been in the industry for 20 years and have uh, been involved in hundreds and hundreds of persona projects for different clients. But one thing I've noticed, and maybe you have too, which is maybe why you're here or watching this later, is that personas get bogged down and stuck. You know, that they almost develop this organizational friction sometimes. Uh, I have a team that I'm thinking about that took the user research and the personas and they put it on their wall in their kind of design room, design decision-making room. And it sat on that wall. It stayed on the wall for an entire year. So that's a, that's, that's a really good sign. I have another client that I'm thinking about that took personas. We uh, print out our personas into kind of 3D format. And um, ever since we started doing that about 10 years ago, I see an, an incredible adoption to persona to the persona data to actually understand, uh, you know, so the the resistance that's like, ah, that's this on a PowerPoint. It's like, yeah, you can reject it. But in when it's 3D and tactile, it makes it something more interesting. So that's an interesting that's an interesting thing to notice. But this one client, I noticed after a few weeks, I think two or three weeks, they took the personas and sh literally shoved them in a closet, like stuck them in a closet in the in the main meeting room, <laughs> which I found them in there. I was looking for some, uh, you know, some whiteboard pens or something. And I was like, what are my personas doing? You know, get your personas out of the closet here, you know, but they, they I guess they didn't have any place to put them or, or whatever. But uh, you know, in the case of that project, there wasn't really organizational friction, but a lot of people use personas and don't understand them. And that includes UX professionals. Sadly, we're, we're like one of the few fields that one of our tools we don't know how to use. So, you know, let's dive into that for a moment. Uh, the history of personas a lot of people attribute it to Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm. You've seen the crossing the chasm thing, I'm sure, before. And it's a book from the early 1990s. But more and more folks were covering personas and marketers as well uh, have been covering personas. Uh, you also have Carol's book uh, called Scenario Driven Design from 2001, I think it is. Um, which is a um, a really good book that is about scenarios, which is when I got started in this field seriously, like in, in corporate environments in 1999, we were calling them user profiles or user uh, roles or user scenarios. So we had like user scenarios and task scenarios. So the user scenario is kind of more overall and the task scenario modeling the tasks. Um, I also have called them in, in around that time, I went on to, to refer to them as user behavior profiles, which is more accurate to what they are, right? So enter around this time, about 2000, 2001, enter Alan Cooper with the inmates are running the asylum. I think that was actually written in 1998, but he started formulating his thought process around this and in, in kind of personas became a thing in around 2001. However, Alan Cooper failed to tell us how to use personas correctly 
uh, how to use personas in a role-based format, which is the topic of today's webinar. <laughs> And when I said it's the only game in town, it's based on my experience and also my experience of watching people sort of spin off and, you know, crash and burn with their persona efforts or their use of personas and, and sort of watch the industry do that. Um, so Alan Cooper stayed at a very high level. He called goal directed design. He was busy trying to brand that. He was introducing personas. I think he once said that he was the he's the person that that created personas. He had that on his website at, at one point. Um, I'm talking like 10, 12 years ago or so. Um, but so so I think if we could point if we could point a finger, which I don't really want to do, but if we could attribute the why, it's the lack of leadership in the UX industry. The UX industry has been bickering, quite frankly, been arguing amongst itself for so long about personas, whether they're good, whether they're bad, and maybe you like them, maybe you hate them. Like here's an example from a new UX book just published. And this is what they say. Personas are fictional people, ah, <laughs> crafted for design inspiration. Uh, these fictional people are usually aggregates of, re of real users, right? So that's, the blue is correct. The red is not. So personal characteristics, including the capture of user psychologies, I'm not sure what that means. Needs and goals, yes. Or demographics, no. Their creators often give them evocative names. Okay, that's an interesting way to, like, disappointed David or protective Pam. At least they got that last part, because a lot of people don't do that. Um, so the bits in red are no. And this is a brand new book that just, I just bought it in 2021. Um, when this is being recorded, I just bought it. And the thing is, it's not this book, and I won't name it because I don't want to distract from it. It's not a book about personas. It's a book about UX and users. Um, the, this is very typical. You know, I attend academic conferences and I hear, it's like when I hear, I heard an academic sharing some information about testing and they said, we did focus groups. We did, they called them focus group workshops, and that was supposed to be a user test. I hear UX professionals, even experienced UX professionals using the term focus groups, like it's just a normal neutral thing. So personas are not fictional people. <laughs> we don't, unless you want to live in fiction, like who do you know that wants to live in fiction? Like don't even use that word. Like this is <laughs> about making decisions for real customers, for real business problems, not fiction. You know, it's almost like because I think like because there's a marketing side to personas or, or history to it. It's also the case that they come from user research and not a lot of people do user research or don't have a lot of experience doing user research. So it's easy to sort of just go, oh yeah, personas, they're fictional people. They're not fictional people. <laughs> I'll tell you why you'll, and you'll have a replacement for that. Just a slight course correction. We're switching from a marketing persona into a design persona. Because quite frankly, I don't care about marketing personas because I'm not a marketer. I care about design personas because I'm a designer and a researcher and I'm trying to change user or customer behavior. You see what I'm saying? So um, this is an example of an oversimplified persona. A lot of the templates that you get with tools, like free templates, are not your friend. They're, they're not helpful. So be careful with free templates for personas. Um, better off making your own. This is a better persona. Look how it describes concise behavior. Think of your users or your personas as roles and your life will be a lot easier. Why do I say that, right? Because, um, because I can tell you something about myself um, and you'll uh, learn some things about me, um, but I perform certain roles. For example, I'm a husband, a father, a son, you know, so you then you're OK, what what is then the, now you can explore each of those and say, OK, that's a function that I perform. Um, you don't really need to know about me to design for me, but you need to know what roles, what hats I wear. 
that's the underlying premise of role-based design. Like, don't get into the drama of the user and their life, the fact that they, you know, exercise or they don't exercise or that they have, uh, you know, um, wear nice clothes or they wear nice shoes. That's not that important unless you're designing for Louis Vuitton, unless it's a fashion-based, you know, uh, uh, project that you're working on. In that case, hugely important, right? Hugely important that you cover details like sizing, this kind of clothing works for me, this kind of clothing doesn't due to my body uh, shape or due to the brand doesn't size it properly. Uh, so that that would be important, but th the key is that I'm shopping for something that fits, that looks good, not the fact that I like something, you know, uh, that's uh, fashionable or not, um, or that I'm 25 years old or that I'm, you know, like make this amount of money or whatever. Uh, so a role is a state that a user assumes or a navigation that they're exploring with. It's driven by goals and tasks, right? So when, when Cooper brought in goal-directed design, he, he forgot he didn't really talk about tasks or subtasks. There's three layers. There's goals, tasks, and subtasks. He didn't really talk about that. He didn't really go deep into it. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. Nobody talks about this. No one mentions this. Uh, very few people discover it, but I'm kind of like reflecting on why this is um, driven by actual behavior. And that's why they're not fictional. <laughs> that's why I don't even use the F word um, because um, though though they are um, fluid, there's another, there's another F word as in role switching. In, in other words, that users switch hats, they'll change. In other words, if I have three, like I told you I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a, a, a father, I'm a son. Those are three different hats that I change into. So there are three different personas based on what I'm doing, based you know, based on my interaction or my behaviors as a husband, as a father, as a, a son, for example, right? Um, and that's what you're trying to figure out, right? You're trying to figure that out. Um, remember that the word persona actually means mask in Latin, right? So remember roles are actions. You are not a role, right? Um, a role is something you do. In other words, as personally, you're a person. If I was just to see you as a role, if you were just to experience me at a personal level through my roles, you wouldn't really understand me, right? But that's not what we're doing in UX. It's the opposite. We don't want to get to know the user at a personal level necessarily. We want to understand what they're trying to do. You know, it might be motivated by personal experiences or cultural experiences or disability experience or right? It might be motivated by those things, but at the end of the day, I'm trying to get stuff done, you know, I'm trying to get up a set of stairs in a wheelchair. I'm trying to apply for something uh, that's in a PDF format that I can't access uh, because it's not tagged properly uh, for blind users uh, and so forth and so on. So think of your roles as hats the user wears, right? They, they put on the hat in order to perform some function and just like these hats they're different right the hat is different for the job right jobs to be done uh this is coming from this idea of tasks um, and now we say that there's a role performing this task right that's what a persona is this is bully and betty one of my personas from a field study. And you can see that I've put like the priority, the type of user it is. Like you can add in the, the marketing segment for people that are from the marketing world, because this isn't about creating some elitist, you know, closed society of UX terminology and jargon and deliverables. That's not what UXers should be about. You should be about access and about bridging. So you have people that are like Boolean, like, what's that? And I'm like, oh, it's a library power user. And the reason I called her Boolean Betty is that's all she does is use Boolean searches. She's so comfortable with Boolean. And notice I have even action items down here. So I have cognitive background and the tools that this persona uses. And then there are some other personas down, down there. Um, so we'll talk more about this up here, but this is what, what we call an associating adjective, a Boolean Betty or duplicate Debbie is another one of my personas from a different project. Duplicate Debbie is just driven crazy by duplicates. There, we saw users that were starting their day drinking energy drinks in order to get through the amount of work, duplicates being one of the problems, you know. 
So I was going to say, you see, there's a face there, even though it's a roll, it's there's a face there. <laughs> the reason we use a face is because the face is a powerful thing for a human being. And one of the things in UX is we're trying to humanize software, right? We're trying to make it um, uh, people friendly. And we know that faces resonate. Paul Ekman did some groundbreaking research in the 19, late 1970s. And he found out that there are these micro expressions um, that uh, occur in like, you know, a quarter of a second. So we have macro expressions like things that we actually see. And then there's micro expressions. And he works a lot with police departments, you know, people like that to, to notice people concealing their true emotions or their intentions because he's done some scientific work to show that you can detect someone's emotions from micro expressions. And this is probably why we use pictures in personas, even though they're not people. And I know that's really confusing and contradictory. I surrender to the contradiction, <laughs> but the reason we use them is just a tradition because it kind of activates a little bit of empathy. Um, it's though if what's in your persona is fluff, is made up, is fictional, is make believe, is um, written by someone with an English degree <laughs> that is a good a good at prose, you know, can write really well, um, but it's not based on actual experience then your teams are going to be suspicious and it's not going to be that well received. So you'll notice with the mask on, and maybe this is a hack for you with your persona is to remind you that it's a role, is put a mask on it. See how with COVID wearing masks blocks your access to those micro expressions and now it's kind of all above the, though I'm reminded that you can smile with your eyes, right? So even with a mask on, you can send them. Have you noticed that how we've become adapted to sending emotional or being aware of the emotion sent by our gaze or by our eyes or the micro expressions, the twistedness of our eyes, even though um, you might like the, the guy in the top middle, he might be smiling under the mask and it shows in the softness of the eyes. Right. So maybe that's a hack. Maybe put a mask on your persona. Maybe the issue is that we use static images. You know that check this out imagine if you had a persona and your persona was a video you know that why not you know it's really only the technology notice that in this video that i'm playing now hopefully it's playing for you as well that the persona got up and went over to help the other user and now uh, the the thing the thing that that i'm trying to get you to do is move out of that static image of the person that you think you need to get to know and get into the thing that they're doing. It's the getting up and going over and helping the other user. That's the most important part in role in UX and roles, right? Uh, the question of diversity in stock photos, if you use stock photos, which you know use stock photos. By the way, the video on the last screen was just a thought experiment that was inspired by one of my students in the UX Inner Circle had asked me before this webinar um, about uh, this contradiction of these, you know, we were talking about images. But yes, you should use diverse images. Of course you should, not, not because necessarily because you're trying to say something about a particular uh, cultural group or race, but just because it's good practice to have diversity represented um, just like it is everywhere. Um, and, you know, uh, and so, so yes, diversity in your images, yes, as much as possible, you know, unless you're designing an all women experience, then all your stock is gonna be women. You don't need the, the mix of gender or whatever, you know, um, and you can turn any role into any type of character or user. Um, so, the thing about faces is I just mentioned is they activate like a little bit of empathy. And do you have empathy? Like there's this big debate in the UX community there has been over the last few years about whether empathy is real or not. I mean, only people that are not human seem to not have empathy. Empathy is one of our defining characteristics as human beings. We have a, a bunch of, of uh, neurons in our frontal cortex dedicated to activating activating empathy not doing it well 
but activating it. So just like this, I don't like this is a picture of a crash, car crash. Have you ever seen anybody die? That's not a Slido poll question, by the way. But have you seen somebody, have you seen a woman give birth to a child? Have you, um, have you seen someone very, very old, and I'm talking like in their 80s or 90s, using a computer for the first time? And so forth and so on, because those experiences, and I've seen all of those three, um, are like, it's very difficult for you to go, well, I'm not really sure until I, uh, you know, I need to think a little bit more about this. <laughs> Let's see, hmm, somebody dying, you know. Um, but I'm reminded of the time I was in Portland and I saw four different police cars stopping uh, a car with three black men in it. Um, and I was standing across the street looking and there was another white guy that came and stood beside me. And I went, wow, this is that they arrested the guy. The one of the I don't know. Sorry, they arrested all three of them. They arrested them all in a space of about 10 minutes. And then they unarrested them. They removed the handcuffs. So they put the handcuffs on. And we're talking about four police cars pursuing one car with three black guys in it. And they all, with weapons drawn. This is the United States. This is pre-George Floyd. Um, today, I think, is the anniversary, actually, of George Floyd. So it's a good story to tell, right, in terms of. But I, the thing is, I stood there. And this white guy came up next to me. We were in the car park about to go into the store grocery store and I said to him wow this is terrible uh it, it this is like racial profiling this is complete racism in the police and and this guy said to me well no you don't know that you, you can't be sure of that and I was like I was like um uh wow and I was like yeah you can but my point of that story is that Empathy is not automatic, and maybe that's why we're, we debated in the UX community whether empathy is good, whether you should use it, whether you shouldn't use it. Is it real? Is it bullshit? What is it? You know, um, and 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 sort of people fighting about it on LinkedIn, for example. It's it's crazy. <laughs> um, so I'm going to teach you about the latest science, neuroscience in empathy today, so that you never have to ask the question again. Um, and um, uh, and so I want you to look at this picture. See this woman here? What's what's her story? What I, what I want you to do is I want to I want to go to breakout for five just a five minute activity. If you've never done a breakout, what happens is your experience of sitting there. You think you're watching a webinar. You're going to be sent into a room with two people or three people. It's just going to be the two or three of you privately, and you're going to do this activity. Uh, you're going to uh, look at the image, the previous image, that woman, and I'll take a sheet of paper and make a left and right column like I have below. On, a, on the left side, list out the demographics, and on the right side, list out the behaviors. And I like to evolve personas, you know, so it, it, like don't be trapped by a template with a persona or even with a journey map, like uh, adjust it to your needs. This persona is good. Um, other than the ambiguity of he needs heads downtime, going through a gender transition, um, uh, these two things jumped out at me. Um, and then the name Steph. So the name Steph is individual contributor, right? We have that. So better if we use an association ad associating adjective. One of the biggest deficits of most persona efforts is the lack of an association ad associating adjective. In other words, a descriptor, a verb that says, you know, what that. So it's um, getaway Greta is is the VW person or um, run run for the sun Rhonda, you know, or something that really um, brings together what you saw in the user research and, and 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 really communicates that to the team without having to remember is that Steph or is that Julie? Who's who's the individual contributor again? Is that was that Sarah or was that oh is that oh Steph? I knew it was something with an S. Um, all of a sudden with association adjectives, associating, associating adjectives, if I can actually say that, <laughs> um, you start, the team starts to remember that. And it's so fun to watch that process. The reason I, I uh, circled uh, heads down and, and going through a gender transition is this is trying to be an inclusive persona, but I feel like it just kind of got slipped in there. 
And if you slip disability in there or slip inclusion sort of markers in there uh, without giving justice, like if you're trying to tell us that this is a, an inclusive persona that uh, went through a gender transition, this, that, this, that this type of individual contributor represents the type of users who have gone through a gender transition as well as sort of trying to support uh, a team or whatever, right? Or, or trying to be part of a team at work in a B2B situation. Then give it more justice. Like uh, what I'm trying to say to you is be careful you don't tokenize, that you just kind of like, you know, slip in a, a disabled persona in your persona pack. You slip in uh, different races. You just kind of slip it in without actually giving it the full attention the full justice that it deserves. So it's about what they do, not who they are. Woo! It's about what influences their decisions and actions, right? You think about uh, the persona from a behavioral lens. Um, and there was there was a, a question. Let me let me see if I can I. Let me see if I can multitask with teams. Let's see, there was a question earlier and I just kind of wanted to go to it because it's relevant to this. The question was, um, yeah, I guess it was a question about, is from Louis and he says, uh, is, is there a difference between buyer persona and, and a marketing, so a, he says a buyer persona is a marketing persona and, a, and just a regular persona. Um, to be clear, a buyer persona or a B2B persona or so-called buyer persona is a legitimate persona. It's not necessarily a marketing persona. Just because someone is a buyer doesn't mean they're in marketing or just because it's B2B doesn't mean it's marketing. Like, for example, my buyer personas, they have the same thing. So they say like, you know, due diligence, Debbie, she, because that buyer persona has to do due, due diligence on a service or software or whatever to, 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 um, so, you know, and another buyer persona, um, is, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, approval Allen, you know, so his, he's all about, I need all the data to get an approval because he is part of the buyer, uh, team, that persona approval Allen, he needs to convince his boss. He needs all the checkpoints that are the things, you know, the checklist items uh, in order to, to get the approval for the thing that he's buying or his team or his company is buying. So that it's, you know, don't don't be confused. Just because it's B2B or buyer doesn't mean it it's a, a marketing persona, to be clear, is one that relies just on the demographic side and tells you all about the person, who they are. And what we want to know in role base is what they do, what their influences are, what their decisions and actions are. Um, it's not the F word. <laughs> I, I, I'm just playing, by the way, if you're wondering if you think I'm really angry or something. I'm just um, trying to have fun in a German kind of way, I guess. Uh, that they are composite users or archetype, better words. Better words. I will never. You'll never hear me saying fictional because it's so misleading, uh, you know. But maybe it's a confession that you cooked it up, you know. And I've seen too many teams. And I remember going to a presentation. This is a long time ago. This is like in the year 2000, and it was Frog Design. I think it was like, uh, no, it was actually one of these big design houses like Frog or, um, I think it was actually Organic. I don't know if they're even around anymore. But somebody asked, where did you get the data for your personas? Somebody raised their hand and the woman said, oh, um, I think the uh, I think the marketing team or the design team, or I'm not sure where they, they um, came up with it internally. And I was just sitting there going, ah! <laughs> because to be clear, and we'll talk about this in a second, they need to come from data. So they're composites, they're composites of behavior and they're archetypes of those roles that your users play and they need to have pain and joy. Two important things. Um, now, one of the questions that I've talk, talked a little bit about user research is, should you interview people? Yes, you can interview people, but you want to blend it with an observation. 
So interviews are fine if you don't just use it like a survey where you're reading off questions or focus grouping it. You know, focus groups, if you didn't catch my earlier comment about that, are also a, a bad F word uh, that gets thrown around too much as if it's a legitimate behavioral research technique. It's not. A focus group is a market research technique developed in the United States after World War II in order to sell products, in order to sell cereal boxes, things in a supermarket, material goods, post-war boom kind of, you know, think uh, um, uh, the, the the show, I think it's a Netflix show called, um, uh, I think it's, is it? No, not the yes men. I, I'm I'm blanking the the name of the show, but there's there's a program about advertising on Netflix that's really funny, and it's they they do focus groups in there. So focus groups are about swaying people's opinions. Do you like this candidate? Do you like this toothpaste? Do you think this is a good idea? Should our navigation be like this? Do you think that that if we did this, it would have an impact on your behavior? Like, would this be something that you might like respond to? Like, that's focus grouping and surveying. Surveys we use, but we use them in conjunction with observations and interviews, right? So we're talking about contextual interviews. And this is a classic example of this image of a timeline was above this uh, IPO uh, initial public offering in, at a, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. It's, a, it's an organization that's part of the United States uh, federal government and approves IPOs of startups when they, so for when Facebook went IPO or when Airbnb went IPO, uh, they go, it goes on this person's desk and there's a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day review period of the IPO application. Now, like, why do you have this? Everybody knows this knowledge. Why, what's this? Oh, said the user. Oh, well, I, I forget because that we were so overloaded and then he showed us the boxes and boxes of Right. So if you can do these on site observations better, if you can't, then you're going to resort to online interviewing and using a diary study. Um, the other classic one that you want users to show you is how they you know, this is a workaround. They're putting past deals on a spreadsheet and they're taping up the timeline to the, you know, can you imagine the software actually carrying that weight for you instead of like having you as a user do these workarounds? Right. So when you do this observation, it's like a co-discovery, it's like an empathy transfer is what I consider it. Because they're saying, oh, this is why I do this. Like, see this job queue here? This is their job queue on the left in this image. And these are some important steps and documents and things that they had pinned up above the screen on the right. So let's talk about empathy, now we're on empathy. It's the starting point in design thinking. But Don Norman told us in 2019, that it's useless for UX. Instead, find the problems users are trying to solve. Yes, um, but dot, 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 Tim Brown, um, it's a means to an end, not the end solution. And that's, you know, it seems to me to be a more sensible, like the whole debate about empathy is like, the point isn't just to go do empathy with a user and then try and bring the empathy back to your design. The point is just to use the empathy to spark off the exploration, to understand the problems that users are trying to solve by activating, properly activating those healthy mirror neurons that accurately saw the black guys getting arrested and unarrested. In what, what country do you know where police arrest people and unarrest people? In what city do you know that to be the case? Well, at this point in time, uh, Portland was actually on the list, top 10 list of cities with institutional racism in the police force, according to the Department of Justice of the federal government of the United States. That story took place in 2016, 17 in Portland. But allowing your perceptions to accurately judge, right? This is this is the issue. We. This is what neuroscience shows us. This is in the book Social by Matthew uh, Lieberman. Do, this book details dozens and dozens of MRI studies of magnetic resonance imaging studies. And what he says basically is the mirror neuron system that I mentioned before that Galassi uh, exposed activates how something is happening and what, which is useful for us, right, in, U, in UX actions and perceptions of actions, getting arrested, not getting arrested, 
Easy to use the website, not easy to use the website. Having problems managing their job queue or not? Well, goal understanding, steps and procedures, aha. But as Lieberman shows, you need the second part to understand. There is like empathy is these two systems. It's not just one thing. And nobody's really like digging into this research and talking about it, even though we're coming up to a decade of this being published in a in a book. Uh, the mentalizing system, this mentalizing system brings in context and meaning. Now, if you're really good at empathy, good for you, because for me, empathy is just the skill that I just keep. It's like an onion. I keep peeling it and peeling it and peeling it. And it's like you can never get done learning empathy. It's from what I can tell. Right. Um, but uh, so this mentalizing system is about intention, understanding intention, context, mm, why questions. Mm. So if you like mystery novels, you have a very active mental uh, advanced mentalizing system, right? Uh, if you see the the um, uh, someone dying and and you know D doctors without borders, you you your mirror neurons are active, right? You're like, oh my god, I, this someone needs to help, right? Or if you care about the environment, et cetera, et cetera, right? <laughs> I could go on. Um, the problem is correctly doing this, and the way you correctly do this uh, use of empathy and the uh, mentalizing, or it's also called mind reading is through user research, is through ethnographic research, and not just doing interviews or surveys, but combining them with some observational, um, uh, you know, data, you know, having the user walk you through and watching them and so forth. Um, so mind reading leads to understanding, effect matching is about helping or avoiding uh, issues and, you know, danger, for example, and then empath, empath and empathic motivation is about the brain mimicking their distress. So this is this is when we say feel the user's pain, it's activating this system of empathy of, of uh, mirror neurons and me, uh, mentalizing or mind reading, right? And so these other this is this is the science of what's happening with empathy, right? So for me, there's no debate. It's just that to find their pain, you need to follow their pain. And you need to um, focus on their behaviors. This is a great example of the kinds of things that would end up in a persona: goals, needs, motivation, behavior, pain points. Done. That's you know it's pretty simple with one bullet up here and so forth. But I usually have maybe like you know 30 to 50 bullets or something uh, close to for each of these. Brenda Laurel, the wonderful grandmother of virtual reality and user researcher and UX pioneer said, if you don't have pain in your persona, it's not real. So that's one, remember I mentioned earlier, and joy, remember the joy, the woman at the beach that just stole the VW, <laughs> um, or who wants to go nudes, nudes swimming, right? Um, if you're, If that makes you feel weird and creepy, that's a reminder that when you do user research, when you feel their pain, it's about their values, not yours, right? And that's how bias creeps into user research. Um, and that's how we end up with accidental exclusion. So how well you do empathy depends on how often you do it and how well you activate it. You've got to activate the thing and you've got to do it often. Uh, this has been around the block, Bob. He's one of my personas. And just to show you like what one of my personas. Now, Whitney Quisenberry mentioned in, in her book that you can use, you can write personas in different tenses. This is a first person persona. It's actually, and I since I since I read that in Whitney Quisenberry's book and, and heard her speak once, I started playing around with doing this and using verbatim. So now, like, and I haven't stopped doing it since. I love doing it's like so much easier actually. You use your actual user data, your verbatim, and you build your persona. Like so, 95% of the persona is verbatim. Maybe even has like pronunciation, spelling errors, whatever. You know, like and then then you know it's from the real data because you copied and pasted it from your verbatim notes, not your interpreted notes, but your verbatim notes. Um, 
I'm going to be actually doing a, a masterclass on ethnograph, conduct how to conduct ethnographic interviews if you're interested. That's a topic I will mention in there, which is um, how to capture notes and observe correctly so that you get good data. Let's let's go through those eight persona musts. So based on evidence, some of these should be familiar by now. Crafted as a team. So if you can look at the data together, and we're about to do an exercise in that, and you'll see um, that firsthand. Think about time or longitudinal so-called spectrum personas. So Microsoft uh, research uh, has done some interesting toolkits on inclusion, inclusive design, also the topic of a webinar I'm doing next week if you're interested on inclusive design and a master class later in, in the month. Um, that spectrum personas are about noticing the use across time so that you can see unintended consequences or novel uses of the, um, uh, you, you know, the thing, the behavior. Uh, so there's number four, role-based, pain and joy, check, right? Um, prioritized, so primary, secondary, based on business objectives. Micro, speaking of Microsoft, Microsoft Research also has, um, just coincidentally, has a tool for prioritizing personas based on feature and the persona. It's called the, uh, the feature persona uh, waiting tool, W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, -I -I waiting tool. Uh, so number seven is story driven, that these are stories and they're probably one of the most important pieces in terms of the soft skill of storytelling, which I believe is a UX soft skill, that you want to be able to socialize your team with the stories that you heard, the things you heard, saw, felt, uh, noticed, uh, that you found surprising, those stories, those one minute stories, those three minute stories, those 10 minutes, you know, whatever, maybe not 10 minutes, uh, let's say one to three minutes stories can be powerful, right? Um, and then the eighth one there is decision directing that you transform. This is why you do personas because you're trying to transform your team's thinking about a user, about a task, about a problem they're trying to solve. Make sure it's from authentic data sources. You know, outside in, not inside out. Don't cook them up inside. Don't even, don't even do it. Don't, don't even go there. Um, and it comes from user researcher, what Genevieve Bell, who is formerly a director of UX at Intel, called deep hanging out. Hanging out with users. In other words, getting to know them, just being in their space with them, activating empathy. And, you know, I, I, when I first heard this, I thought that's hilarious. That's so casual and informal. And the more that I thought about it, I thought those are the exact precise words, deep hanging out. Okay, so two sides of UX, usability and, and desirability. I mentioned these earlier. Usability, does it work? Desirability, is it what I want, right, in the first place? So um, desirability is where we find emotional value. Follow the post-it notes, what's on them? Why, why do they help? What happens next? This is part of your interviewing and researching and context to use. What's happening? What's really happening? Because remember what people say and what they uh, say they do and what they think they do are two different things. Um, so when is it happening? Why? What's the goal? And this is an actual photo. Look at the ecosystem of apps for the delivery. This guy is ha handling orders in with no restaurant COVID. So that's an interesting one, right? Uh, you want to conduct context research or ethnographic interviews. Goal-directed design, what's the priority? What are the goals? Uh, activity center design, so what activities are taking place? These, these actually reference uh, design approaches that are actually documented and have been used to design products, uh, the, the TiVo and certain, uh, the, um, the Harmony, which Logitech created, um, uh, and bought the company, used Activity Center Design, a very famous, successful case study. But what's happening in that place? Uh, what tasks are going on? So scenario-based design or task-oriented design, typical behaviors, tasks. Um, and you might even look at things from a motivational design. This is also another type of design that's that's going on. I'll put these back up on the screen for you. I, let's let's jump to the last section then. Um, and we can talk we can talk more in the Q&A. So spanking your personas, governance, evangelism and persona management. So Alan Cooper, who I talked about earlier, 
the so-called you know inventor of personas, um, actually said that most software needs to be spanked very famously. And he has a great sense of humor. He's a he's a great he's a great guy. Don't get me wrong. Like <laughs> Alan Cooper's, he's great. Um, it's just that he didn't give us too many tips about these personas he invented. I think most personas need to be spanked. <laughs> so how to use personas, um, reviewing your scenarios as you design, comparing the priority to your business objectives, bringing balance, prioritizing the tasks, what's important for the user, you know, what's important for desperate Dan or, you know, total relaxation, Tina, the woman that's needs to get to the beach or get to a space to, to unwind because she's retired, but she's still so, so can't, can't slow down. Uh, using it as a walkthrough tool, and that's what's happening in this picture above here. I'm holding up a wireframe. The personas are on the right. I mentioned earlier those 3D personas that actually um, have more impact. Uh, and then referring back to user and task persona data. So it's important, I think, that you use personas with their kind of sister uh, activity, which is journey maps, right? And um, and the two go together. So let's talk about governance. It's so real data. So activating empathy properly, right? That way you build social intelligence, right? Because empathy is is uh, Daniel Goleman, the the uh, inventor of author of emotional intelligence, and he wrote a book called Social Intelligence. Chapter six, he says that empathy is the defining characteristic of social intelligence. Empathy, the defining characteristic. Uh, so when we say evidence-based, that's what we're talking about. We want everybody on board. So we want to bring the personas and the journey maps together and um, in a workshop format and socialize the data and build out the journey map based on the personas and the user research. Um, fully funded goes without saying uh, and or a service design program underneath your personas or journey mapping efforts uh, and um, track data uh, of what happens with once you implement so important to add metrics uh, it's important that you build a persona management journey mapping practice as part of your cx or ux efforts and prioritize what's important uh, from a customer centric perspective and and then make sure someone's owning all this right um, so and a tip here after each workshop that means exactly deadlines responsibilities success criteria and the decisions that you can put into decision log even so that's some some governance practical governance kind of tips for personas uh, and journey maps you can also create like posters like propaganda basically to get the post uh, the uh, the persona info out there uh, different teams have done different things i mentioned associating adjectives and I used to make them rhyming for fun, like Tech Spec Tina or Duplicate Debbie or What If Wanda. Uh, you want to make sure that you're getting the composite behavior, the, 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 the thing that you want your team to understand, right? Not just some boring aspect that, that's a pattern, but something that emotionally sort of like, like Technical Spec Tina was a car buyer. And it turned out that of the... Eight, I think we had eight personas. Only one of them was interested in, uh, no, sorry, two of them were interested in tech specs and the other six were not. So it was like, okay, tech spec Tina, um, she's looking at the technical specs on the vehicle, uh, but nobody else really cares. All the other personas are more interested in the comfort and things that for our client, they were surprised because uh, they thought it was all about the technical specifications. I love this image. It reminds me of bring your make your personas come to life. This is a Danish software firm from the 90s. You can see the really old computers there. Uh, but think about the online version. Like, what's the online version for this? Right? Is um, uh, you know maybe you're using a share tool tool like Miro board or uh, a PowerPoint uh, presentation. How can you bring that alive? Right? Because maybe you can't do this in person type of version. But how do you keep your personas active and maintained? Uh, Amazon supposedly has like an empty seat in their company. So what's your version for online? Um, one thing I want to say, like for this decade, this is my, these are my rules for effective use is they must include actual users. They must be based on actual uh, user data, as I've emphasized in this webinar, and be role-based and be believable and include pain and joy. 
as Brenda Laurel told us, and be used to guide your design decisions. Uh, and Journey Maps, also research-based on personas, owned by the team and uh, showing pain channel by channel, right? So it's it's team sport is the new lens on this, and it's a way to bring people together. Um, I'm at experiencedynamics.com in the on the consulting side. I'm writing a book actually on UX management. Uh, if you've taken my Interaction Design Foundation course on UX management, that might be interesting to you. And I'm doing, if you're interested in, in teaching and learning more like this, uxinnercircle.com is a monthly membership site where we just have way too much fun. Uh, so thank you so much, UX Joburg, and let's go to questions whenever you're ready. Right. Thanks for that, Frank. Um, really super insightful and thanks for sharing all of your tips. Um, I think um, all of us definitely learned something tonight. Um, so Mika is having some network problems. I'm going to take over from her just to wrap up. So um, in terms of questions, um, so we've got a question from Jane Sutherland. Um, so her question is, when you include jobs to be done in your personas, are you including social and emotional jobs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like to call these um, social and emotional um, uh, criteria or part of the evidence base. So you're looking for social uh, phenomenon. And uh, when we say social phenomenon, we're talking about how other users are interacting what like for example in the buyer persona there's definitely going to be a team of people or decision makers above and beyond that core user that's your buyer persona for example so who are they what are what are the needs there um college when you go your child is going to university we found with studies and just for a bank you know a bank is supporting loans because the the loans are the uh, university is very expensive in america so you have to basically get a bank loan so who's making the decision about the university? And it, it turns out there's the school counselor. And the, so that's an example of and the parent, you know, and maybe the grandparent. It's an example of a social effect. Um, and emotional effects are um, also worth noting. And I actually have an entire masterclass on emotional value and emotion design uh, for that. But yes, absolutely critical. If these two, the social and emotional jobs to be done, if you will, or those factors or criteria are, to be clear, the differentiators, the differentiators in any mobile app, in any, uh, you know, immersive VR, it has to be, like you start there as a default in VR and AR, um, and uh, also are hugely important if you're doing service design or designing services or product service combinations, which we mostly all are these days, by the way, service product design is so looking for moments of truth, right, in a journey map or in a service uh, experience, that's an emotional high point, a moment of truth where you go, ah, I love this brand, you know, uh, or this, I love that service experience, you know, it was, it was the best. Uh, my uh, daughter uh, did a custom bra fitting. It was very popular with with young women that are just coming of age and middle schooler, right? When she was in middle school, there was a bra fitting experience at this retailer. And uh, it was actually pretty expensive. It was like $60 or something like that, you know? And, but it was like the custom deluxe, this woman helped, you know, size you properly. So it's a sizing experience. And all the other girls are like, yeah, you have to get to check out the, the Nordstrom bra fitting experience. Um, zoom up like some years later, and I was asking my daughter about that. I said, dad, you remember the bra fitting experience like that? Cause I was talking about, another type of um, sizing uh, uh, study that, that I'm working on actually with clothing manufacturer. And um, so I asked her, I said, what about that? You know, and she said, yeah, except they gave me the wrong, like so it's actually the wrong size. I've been wearing the wrong size for like five years and only last year learned how I uh, got a sizing calculator on cal calculator on Reddit on the social, you know, the chat site, Reddit. So I went on Reddit and got a, a bra sizing calculator, calculated the correct size, and now I buy the right size for my bra. And I was like, uh, so that that speaks to 
Uh, remember I, I mentioned longevity of a persona, the a get a long time. There we have a wonderful experience, a wonderful service. And, you know, in the moment, but what about over time? What about when that, if it's young girls that are consuming that bra fitting experience, what is the experience as they grow into into women and are they still is it is, did we get it right so what's the post that's an example of an emotional uh, uh, job to be done or an emotional criteria or factor uh, that you would want to make sure you are capturing and bringing into your design fantastic Frank thank you Frank so um, just in the interest of time, I think we're going to stop the Q&A at this point. Um, so there will be some networking afterwards. So um, Frank, I don't know if you still have time after this to stick around and maybe ask, uh, answer some questions in the breakout rooms. But um, otherwise, um, people can also find you on LinkedIn. So if there's any unanswered questions, I'm sure they can reach out to you and that you'll be happy to, to give them some feedback there. Yeah, so, totally, totally. I'd be happy to connect on LinkedIn. I see Vasilis is actually uh, saying he wants to connect on LinkedIn. So, um, Yasu Vasilis, um, <laughs> um, and um, uh, yes, and I look forward to uh, to, to chatting with you. I, I do have some time actually to to hang out for a while or to answer any other uh, questions. Um, I did have one last. Uh, question if you don't mind on the Slido, slido.com, and it's um, 6862, uh, and it's just how valuable, uh, six, let me just write this down, 6862, um, slido.com, 6862, and it, it's how valuable was this webinar for you? So thank you all so much, and um, Yahoo, thanks for hosting and Mika as well. And uh, thank you all for hanging out and uh, digging into the exercises, activities, and uh, look forward to maybe seeing you on a future webinar. And thank you so much, Frank, for your time. Um, yeah, it's just been super valuable. And um, yeah, thanks for sharing all your insights. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you again in future on UX Joburg. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I was, do you have any, Yahoo, do you have any questions yourself just from what you saw here today or, or uh, are you itching to get to your, um, to, to the, to your uh, um, networking session uh, here? And how does that work, by the way? I, I, I don't, I don't know how, how do you do that virtually? Um, yes. Yeah, so it's also just a breakout rooms. Um, ah, gotcha. So yeah, same principle. It's just um, slightly bigger room. So we've got a, f a few more people in each room um, and then people can just get to know each other and maybe talk about tonight's topic and just um, yeah, network, find out who else is in the community. Um, it's also nice to have a lot of international people in our community these days. So it's uh, yeah, just nice to connect with some new faces. Yeah, cool. Great, great. Yeah, thanks for making it available to like anybody. <laughs> I think also Interaction Design Foundation uh, posted it on uh, their social media. So maybe we have a few IXD efforts here great. in the group. And, and I think all you all you folks maybe are you IXD efforts. Is that right? Um, so yeah, we've got um, at my company, we've got a few people that's uh, part of it. And yeah, we actually love the IXDF training. It's really uh, one of the best resources online. Um, Definitely one of the best training uh, things that's available internationally, and especially for us in South Africa, we don't have a lot of different um, like universities and um, institutions actually doing training. So online seems to be a good way to actually access learning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, it's it's super uh, it's super affordable and uh, accessible, and uh, it's that's kind of my gift back to the to the community. I share a lot of trainings on there and there's there's a there's a mega there's a mega course coming up um, uh, that they're working on that they're producing right now um, but uh, uh, so stay tuned for that one I think the latest one is service design which launched earlier this year which uh, is also getting a lot of good feedback uh, it's kind of in a new format and yeah yeah they think more more stuff to follow there but um, I have next week. I have a free webinar on inclusive design. If anybody's interested, I think you can just 
get on LinkedIn and you'll see, if you follow me on LinkedIn mm -hmm. or check my LinkedIn, you can see all sorts of posts uh, about mm -hmm. it. Um, and uh, um, also I mentioned eth uh, eth how to conduct ethnographic interviews. That's a masterclass with the UX Inner Circle. If you really would like to attend, uh, let me know and I can get you in as a, on a complimentary pass as well. Oh, thanks, Frank. That's very kind of you. So um, looking forward to next month, uh, or actually July, we are going to have a, a speaker called John Jablonski, who is the founder of a website called Laws of UX, and he also wrote a book recently, um, and he's a senior product designer at GM. So um, he's going to share some of his experience and um, actually talk a little bit about his new book, um, as well as all the insights from there. So before we break into the networking at the end, I just wanted to announce the winners of the UX South Africa prizes. So we've got a few winners and um, I'm just going to read them out quickly. So the first one is Luis Teran. Next one, Tabang Maposa, Mika van Vieren, Jane Sutherland, Beno from Germany and Merv Yavuz. So um, if any of you are still on the call, if you don't mind, just maybe popping your email address or maybe a link to your LinkedIn profile, just so that we can share your prize with you um, electronically. So it's going to be a voucher to just um, be able to log into the online conference for UX South Africa. And um, yeah, that's it for tonight. Thank you all for your time. And um, I'm going to allow you to go into breakout rooms at the end. Um, it is optional, so up to you if you want to stay and hang out a little bit more, get to meet some new people. Um, so yeah, if all those winners can maybe just share their details before they drop off the call. And um, then we look forward to seeing you all in July again. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thanks so much, Yahoo. Thanks, thanks everyone else. I'm gonna hang out in your in your uh, networking and do some virtual networking <laughs> for a little bit here. So maybe I'll thanks, see. Thanks, Frank. You. Have a great evening. Cheers, you too. You too. Okay, bye. bye, -bye. You should be whisked away into the rooms shortly. <laughs> All right.